My name is Maria Barnes, and I'm the host of Access Lunchtime. Today we're going to be talking about securing your Access application. Um, and I do have uh, the, the chat window open. Uh, by default, you are each probably muted, uh, but if you have a specific question, you can either unmute yourself and pipe in with that question or uh, type the question in the text conversation, and I will try to keep an eye on that as we go through today. If you joined us last month, um, we attempted to do this presentation, and I was having problems with um, connectivity with my uh, sharing my desktop. So I think those are resolved. I think it actually had to do with uh, Skype for Business and uh, my uh, McAfee, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, where you lock down what what uh, what uh, ports you go to and, and that kind of stuff. So hopefully we have all that um, uh, taken care of at this point. Uh, so today's focus is not going to be on the type of user security that we used to have in uh, Microsoft Access 2003 and earlier, although the last slide does reference that. But in general, the topic today is more geared towards um, how to secure an Access application itself. As you probably know, Access can be both a database and um, a program uh, as far as a user interface, forms and reports, etc. Often in a different type of technology, you would see those as two different technologies an executable of some sort and a database that was sitting somewhere on a server. But access can be one or more physical files setting somewhere on a server or on a desktop. And so by that nature, uh, it is in general out of the package less secure than some other or many other uh, database uh, approaches. So the, the techniques that we're going to talk about today are different ways of making access more secure. And you will not want to use all of these techniques, but you will probably want to pick and choose from these techniques and um, figure out what works best for your particular application. Um, Okay, so uh, these are the things we're going to talk about first. Um, the first of all, we you can actually encrypt, encrypt the database itself with a password. Uh, so if you go to um, the uh, options, uh, or not options, but the file window, uh, there is an encrypt with a password section. Um, and if you do that, you will notice it says here that you have to have exclusive rights um, to do that and it shows you how to um, go about opening that um, by you know getting an exclusive right to that um, so what you want to do I'm just gonna close this and show this closes the file itself And when you open the, oops, instead of using the recent ones, you actually want to go to the the file system itself. Uh, let's see. Okay, so you click on it once. And then um, under Tools, no, nope, under Open, you open it exclusive like that. And if you do that, then it will allow you then to go in and uh, encrypt that. And you can set the password. Uh, you know, you just put in the password. I'm going to use Test. You got to do the same thing. Okay, and then you get a warning. Okay, so now when you open this, uh, 
you should have to enter a, a password, which I'm putting in my test, and it will let you in. Um, so I think you can see, obviously, where this is something that might be useful. And you have to have it open here. Apologies. To un I'm going to take that off. <laughs> You have to, uh, that would be useful if you were using, uh, you know, just a couple of users and you have this out someplace, um, then that could be useful. Um, I don't tend to use that because if you're uh, having. If you're having a lot of users, uh, then you're, and you're just passing around a password to everybody, you lose your security level. You know, it doesn't seem as secure if you're doing that to me. So, um, I, it, again, it's useful in some way, at some cases, uh, if you have a, a small number of, of users or, um, you know, that would prevent, for example, your um, database from being copied and sent to somebody via email or something like that. Um, and then someone couldn't open it if they didn't know the password. Um, uh, also, you can lock down access by using an executable um, at, when you release this instead of an ACCDB or an MDB file. Um, to do something like that, um, you would want to take your, again, go to the File tab and then you choose Save As, and you make an ACCDE. And then you save that um, as, and I've already done this once before, an ACCDE file. So what the ACCDE file is, is an executable. Um, so you can see, and we'll just take a look um, at that directly since I already have it saved. I'm going to go ahead and close this one so we're not confused. Um, If you go in the ACCDE file, then you there's nothing here that you can see. Oops, am I in the ACCDE? I am. Why am I seeing these? Oh, I can't see the view code. I guess I can open these, but there's no view code available. Um, so the code itself is only an executable format. It's not in a format that any users can read it. Um, so that's, um, I, I, I highly suggest doing that um, so users can't get in and one, view your code, or two, modify your code. Um, all right, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, you could go in and hide the navigation pane. So let's open up the other. Um, I don't know that we can do this in the executable here. I have to go back to the other one. Um, well, you can at least see the options on this. I'm sure I'll end up opening the other in a minute. But um, under current database, under options, there are various um, security options, uh, and one of those is whether or not to display your navigation pane or not. And so it, by default, it's checked. But if you um, uncheck that, then when you open the database, this navigation pane here does not open up. And that's helpful um, in a lot of situations. Uh, if they don't see something, then they are less likely to um, go and look at it and, and uh, mess around with it or, uh, or open it or anything like that. So I do use that as well as um, an ACCDE uh, in a lot of uh, the applications that I release. Um, also, there's uh, something that you might consider uh, unchecking. Uh, I, I don't personally do this, but there's an F11 or a special keys option that you can choose here. Um, 
this one right here. You can uncheck that. And that, for example, um, helps prevent something like uh, hitting Alt-11 to um, show your, uh, or F-11 to unhide the navigation pane, or I believe it's um, Alt F-11 to get to your VBA window, you know, those types of things. Um, I, I prefer not doing that because that would also prevent a lot of other normal access shortcuts from working, but um, that, that is an option for you. Uh, you can also go into the Trust Center under Options and control your VBA uh, macro uh, uh, selections, and that's under Trust Center, Trust Settings, or the Trust Center rather, under Macro Settings. Um, so there's four different options on there. You can disable all macros or disable macros with notification or those uh, except for digitally signed macros or enable them all. That's obviously the less, least secure. So if, for example, your, um, and this, I will say that the Trust Center is a, a user-based setting. It's not like we uh, saw before we were talking about current database. These settings stick with the access file, uh, but the Trust Center is a per user uh, setting. So if you're going to be ma making changes to that and you want your users to have changes to that, then you have to do that on each of their computers or there's ways of, of uh, making those filter down uh, to the users through policy and that kind of thing as well. Um, all right. Then other ways you can actually lock your VBA project file with a password. Uh, and I would highly recommend doing that. Um, that way, for example, in an executable, you can't even see any of this. And so to do that, uh, you use the property. And because we're in executable, you can't do that. So let me get back to my ACCDB file. In here with shift 11 so I can actually see everything um, so if I go to my project and right click on my project there is a property section for that um, oh great this one's already password protected and I don't know what I put as my password um, <laughs> Oh, maybe I put no password. That is really weird. Because I can get in here and look at this. Let me pull up a different, I must have been messing with this. I am so sorry. A different database and show you how to do that. All right, so under the protection folder here, you can choose lock project for viewing and then put in a password like that. Um, so if you do that, then if you, next time that you go in, maybe because I have it open, let me close it and reopen it here. then your project will be locked and you can't see it. Um, so if that is the case, then you have to enter the password, you know, to be able to get to any code. And so that's an, just an added level of security, um, prevents others, unless you give them the password from changing your code, even if they had the ACCDB, ACCDB file, excuse me, 
um, and, and it is an added level of security for you. Okay, you can also uh, hide individual objects on your navigation pane. So for example, um, you can, uh, if you had, uh, you know, only, uh, and this is something that uh, is certainly something to consider in, in some applications. Uh, I, I, in general, hide the entire navigation pane but there are instances, for example, when you have super users and they like to create their own queries, uh, but you might hide um, the forms and reports from them and certain queries that you use. Uh, so you can right click on a particular item and uh, hide them. And then depending upon what you have set in your navigation options, um, here I have hidden options, hidden objects showing, but you know if you were going to do that, you would uncheck that and you would not be showing those and magically you know they can't see it. And again, we're talking about uh, the general philosophy. If they can't see it, they won't think to uh, go digging for it. But that's useful in in certain situations, certainly. Um, if you are using an executable to uh, release your project, then it would probably be a good idea, at least in some cases, to just install runtime access on the user's compu computers as opposed to the full um, blown access. If they don't need access for some other reason, then all they have is runtime. Um, they can't open an ACCDB file if that is the case. Uh, but they can open the uh, executables and they will get a very locked down view as far as uh, what they can do and see uh, with only runtime access. They can't pull anything into design mode or anything like that with it. Um, okay, other ways to secure things. Um, this particular um, method is used because uh, access, as far as like the VBA behind it, um, is physically stored, you know, in, in a file. And if we had somebody trying to hack into your system, they could possibly, you know, get at that. Um, and one of the things you can do is, is decompile it before you uh, recompile for the fresh time and release it. And I like to do that through a batch file. Um, basically, decompile is done with a command line option. Uh, so uh, the first bit, and I do it from a batch file because it just seems easier to me with the quotes and, and remembering where things in, are and stuff like that. This first section would be your, the location of your Microsoft Access executable file. And then the second would be the location of the database that you want to decompile and then you open it with the decompile option like that. And what that does is it goes in and um, removes compiled code in the physical ACCDB file. And then when you go in and you um, just run that here, close this, close a couple of these. So what you're going to see is a window opening up, the command line window, and the project opening up. And then um, that has it decompiled, so you can see now that you can compile. Um, so as soon as you then freshly compile it and close your application, then you've got um, a, a cleaner um, ACCDB file. Uh, that only has one version as opposed to change versions of code and other kinds of things that someone might uh, try to get at. Um, next, uh, because Access is a file-based application, you've got stuff in a physical folder, you can lock down folder permissions. 
Um, in order to run something, uh, run an access database, you have to have read and write permissions to the folder. But you could um, lock down the folders where you have your front end and your back end so that only people that you wanted to have access to your application and the data behind your application, which is hopefully if it's a large application stored in on a remote or on a network share or something, uh, and each user should have their own copy of the front end, um, it's only accessible to the people who need access to it. And anyone else from the company, for example, who is not supposed to be in this application should not have access to that particular um, directory or directories. Um, and I often uh, recommend doing that through things like um, Active Directory user groups and folder permissions uh, to make it simpler to manage. Then you just have to add new users to that group as opposed to you know, changing permissions in several folders. Um, you can also, and I have not done this myself, although I have seen people do this, you can actually with code lock down where your database can run from. For example, in VBA, you could put something that said um, if the um, user group that was logged into this is a part of such and such network, um, then let's go ahead and proceed and open this application. Otherwise, let's shut it down because you're not allowed. Um, so that would be useful in the cases where you were talking about something that was you know, maybe had some proprietary company information in it, but it was a very small database that only one or two users had, and you didn't want them to, you know, be able to maybe take it with them to their new job or something like that. Um, so if they got on a different network, um, they couldn't run that. Of course, that might prohibit them from running it from their home laptop, depending upon how they logged into that. Uh, but that's that's an option, um, and if you, you Google that, you can find uh, code on how to do that. Um, it's not difficult to do, it's just, um, you know, determining whatever method you want to use and then comparing that and, and closing things down if it doesn't match that security level. Um, other recommendations. Uh, it is not uncommon to have things like a connection string, especially if you're connecting to a SQL Server or some other outside database in your VBA code. Uh, if you have that and you have your variable named as C-O-N-N-E-C-T-S-T-R or something like that, if someone were trying to hack into your system and it, they were looking at memory in your computer from a text perspective, they might be looking for things like the word connect. And um, up would pop your variable and probably the value near it. Uh, so it's, it's a good idea to do things like um, mask those and, and call it something, you know, we, we used to back in the old days, and I am an older programmer, uh, we had limited number of characters that we could use for our variables. And so we would call things like a variable something like CB or something like that. And, and in today's day and age, we typically use uh, variables that are longer and descriptive and, and often have capital letters in the middle of the variable string so that we can read them well. And, and I highly encourage you to do that and, and keep up that practice. But there are areas like connection strings where that is not a good idea. So, you know, make your connection string variable be something that a, somebody that was trying to hack into your system could not tell that that was a connection string variable. It wouldn't be interested in it. You know, whatever you want to call it, but something, and, and obviously you need to know what it is and be able to remember what it is. So maybe a couple of variables or a couple characters that mean something to you, but um, small and as obfuscated as possible. Um, other types of things you can do. You can limit the data that is kept in your application. Um, for example, let's open our data 
base back up there. Um, in your tables, uh, whether they're link tables or local tables, uh, you have data. Um, and if you've got um, link tables, you don't have the data immediately in here, but you do have in the properties, um, let's see, you know, the, the information about where this is and what the link is and that kind of thing so that you can like here in the description and the the uh the link and all that so all that is in there and if someone were to break into your database they have either that linked information to go point them to the right information or if you have local tables they have actually data in your local tables so to make your application more secure it's not a bad idea to consider um, clearing out the data in your local tables if it's something that doesn't need to, to persist from um, application running to application running. Um, and uh, if you have link tables, it's not a bad idea to actually build those link tables from fresh each time you open it as opposed to keeping them linked. It just makes it a more secure application. It does take just a little longer to open up if you're doing that, so you need to weigh what it is you want to do. Um, but here's a couple examples of how to do um, stuff like that. So uh, to truncate local tables, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, for example, on your, you might set up a public subroutine, like this truncate local table subroutine, and, <coughs> excuse me, um, then on like your main form, whatever you've got your, whether it's a switchboard or a main menu or whatever, on the close of that form with all your local tables, uh, call this truncate local table name and that deletes all the data that's in there. And then you start from fresh and, and there may be tables that you don't want to do that to if they're lookup tables of some sort that you want to keep in there or something, but, um, if there's working tables, you know, that you use to say, for example, you're pulling data from SQL Server into a work area and doing something and processing it. And, you know, you don't need that table data the next time you open the application because you're going to be pulling in fresh information anyway. You might as well make it more secure by deleting the data from that local table before you close out your application. Um, the other example here talks about how you can set up tables from a single table. Um, so I have part of the code in here. I didn't put all of it in just on the, um, for, for uh, simplification purposes here today. Um, but this, this section here um, demos how to remove uh, old links uh, for using a DAO record set. So you open up the DAO record set and that shows you um, all of the, uh, from, from your MS sys objects table, which actually is a table in here. If you haven't uh, seen that before, you have to not only have show hidden objects, but show system objects in order to see your MSYS tables. Um, MSYS objects, yes. So if you look at these, you know, you actually have descriptions of all your different items in here. So you want to look for, all this does is, is reads from that table um, and looks for type equals four, which means table. Um, and then you would uh, circle through those and you would um, delete those. Uh, so those would be, you would want to do that with your uh, linked tables uh, in that case. Uh, and this refresh then just refreshes what is showing like in your navigation objects once you've modified um, the uh, record set or the DAO um, information. And then you might use a single setup table that you look at that say on SQL Server or better yet, a store procedure that you execute so you don't even have any links set up. 
um, that returns a list of the local table name that you want it to be and the server table name that you want to hook to. Um, and you uh, then would use this create, you you'd set up a loop, you know, reading through the entries in that table. And then you would use this create table, table def with the first name, the name you want it to be in your local database um, and the, this parameter. And then the, the name that it is in your SQL server or whatever, and your connection string information. Uh, that creates the table def, and then you add that to um, the DAO record set. Um, so that's that's how you would do this, you know, on entry into your system to build things from fresh. All right, other things. Um, you know, depending upon what you've done with other settings, uh, if you have uh, your project locked down with a password or if you're using an executable then this is not necessary but if some for some reason you decided not to do that uh, you probably have seen where if an error is encountered it gives the user a prompt and it indicates uh, do you want to go look at this or debug this and they do that and magically a line of code is highlighted um, you know, that's useful for you when you're debugging an application you've written, but it's not a good idea to let your users see that. So if you're keeping your application code open, then it would be better to use error handling, which it's good to use error handling anyway, but um, just as an added uh, security here, um, use error handling, and if there's an error, trap it and handle it with a message and, and if, that's, if, if that error handling is in there, then access does not go to the VBA code and show them your code. Instead, it uses whatever methodology you have in your error handling to you know, use the message box and display something to them um, when, when an error is found. You might use a custom ribbon. Um, again, I had... Um, something like uh, the special keys is an option, um, but a custom ribbon would uh, lock down some of the normal activities that you see you know, in uh, your access. If they're using the full version of access and you have a custom ribbon, then they don't see, you know, for example, database tools or you know, maybe the create, um, but maybe they do need other things. Maybe they need some of this formatting and filtering and stuff, but they don't need all of the other um, functionality of the normal ribbon. Um, and we did do a whole presentation several months back on um, modifying the ribbon and using custom ribbons. So if you're interested in that, maybe take a look at, at the YouTube video for that presentation for more details on that. Um, but it does definitely lock down your application if you use a custom ribbon that only gives your users access to the different options that they need for your application. Um, there are people who actually disable the shift bypass key um, and that if you're not familiar with it when you um, go to open an application that has um, in the options set up the current database a form to display on startup if you are opening that application you hold on your shift key and you double click on the um, access application to open it it bypasses that startup form or an auto exe macro if you've got that in your code and opens the application um, so that's something that i keep enabled and i only give my users the executable um, because I want to be able to get in there, but there are uh, different ways if you um, Google that to disable that and to, you know, maybe put a password on it or something like that um, so that if you were operating off an ACCDB instead, you could still um, have the shift bypass capability only for yourself but not for you know others, super users or whoever else you might be working on this with. 
um, you can actually create an auto keys macro um, and in it disable certain built-in key sequences. Uh, for example, uh, control G opens the visual basic engine. Uh, control or editor rather. Uh, control break um, uh, would stop code in the middle and go to it if, if you had code running. Uh, F11 shows or hides the navigation pane. There are, so there's different built-in uh, shortcut key sequences that Access has. And if you build an auto exec macro or auto keys macro, which I just defined what it would basically look at, and then you have to put code in here to, you know, check the the coming in codes to see if there was something specific, and if so, you know, ignore that um, and uh, otherwise process it. Um, that that's another option for making things more protected. Um, so you could you could leave the um, access special keys on in that case, but just disable certain ones of them as a, a safety feature. Um, all right. Then uh, lastly, I want to talk about uh, user tables. So since access after 2003 does not have built-in uh, security options like it had before and and I must admit I never or rarely use that type of built-in access security anyway I kind of always use this approach I find it simpler um, and there are there are other approaches rather than this to um, provide user security but I I think this is one of the simplest um, is to have a user table um, in your application or in your back-end database, um, if, if that's more appropriate, um, and in that have at least a login um, field, and then uh, fill that login field based on the user's Windows sign-on. Uh, let's see if I can find an application that does that here. Okay, so here we have um, a users table, and it's a pretty simple uh, user table. It's got um, the Windows login, so this is the mandatory field. Um, I often put things like email address or whatever, um, and depending upon the level of security, you can have simple security on that table itself, like in this particular application, uh, we want to know if this user is an administrator or if they are not it's just a checkbox um, or if they're a requester which that's just a different type of security for this particular application but the administrator is used for things like you know can they edit the users and and that kind of thing um, if it's more complicated then you might set up a separate role that maps um, users to roles and you had you know specific roles um, in, in this um, application different users belong to different departments and so the the role-based security tells you what users in the, which department um, and so you know different users from different departments can do different things in the application um, uh, let's take a look here at how you get the windows login um, so this is uh, simply making use of a Windows DLL um, to get the username um, so we use uh, that feature uh, in this function here um, to get the login name from this function um, so if you take a look at so I can just run this <coughs> Uh, 
Yeah. That goes in and runs this function and pulls the name. If you're on a work group, I think you sometimes get like the work group slash the login name. Um, so you have to deal with that, you know, if that's the case. Um, and, you know, just allow for that. Either put that in your user table or strip that off or whatever you want to do. Um, but in any case, um, so you can, can make, you know, look at the login that's, that you're coming in with. Um, or you can, you know, have them fill it in on a form someplace. Um, I prefer using the Windows login because that way I don't have to mess with passwords within the application and that kind of thing. Um, but there are people who keep passwords in here and, and use, you know, a user that they put in or use their email address as their user. Um, and, but if you're going to do that, you have to have a password in there because, you know, anybody can figure out someone else's email address. Um, the reason I like using the Windows login is I have to assume that if they're logged in in that computer as whoever, they already have the authority for the application. Um, and it, if that person user is set up in the user table with that. So it's, I just find it to be simpler that way. Um, so you can secure the whole application. They can't get into the application at all. You can put the test um, on at the application level. Uh, so for example, if you look here at where this is called from. Uh, well, it's called from this set user permissions. But set user permissions is done at the very beginning um, of the first form that's opened on the form open event. Um, I call the routine and um, in this routine then if uh, they don't have permissions at all for the application then I say uh, put up a message box that says, you know, this is not a valid user, um, please see your system administrator, and then I do a do command quit, the application shuts down. Um, so that's one level. Uh, you can also do things like an open of a specific form. Um, you can check to see if that user has access to that form, and if they don't, then display a message and close the form. Um, you can, uh, on open of the form, check access and uh, hide specific buttons or what I usually do is have those buttons hidden by default and only if a user may, meets a certain criteria or security level then I unhide the buttons on the form. Um, so again this is a general replacement for the pre-2007 built-in access security which is used to be implemented on the MDW table. All right, so there is a couple other resources, and I will post this slide deck on the Access Lunchtime blog. Today's recording is going to be available on in, within a week uh, on the Access Lunchtime website under the videos. And um, there's a couple good links here to um, what, um, See if I can copy those into the chat so you guys can have those and copy those yourself rather than having to read this. Um, first one. More details in here about how to do some of these specific things. Uh, Eric brings up, and yes, please, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions or type questions at this time. We have 15 minutes left in our time um, about other questions you have or other ways you found. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, Eric brings up the fact that you can use custom navigation groups to make the navigation pane more useful and more secure. Um, so what he's talking about there is in um, the navigation options, you can build um, custom groups um, and you can add 
you, um, a group, and then you can add items to the group. Um, and you know, you might make uh, one of those uh, with, you know, for example, in in the list here. And this doesn't apply to this application. Um, itself, but in, in the example that I was talking about where we have different departments and they're allowed to do different things, you might have um, a group for each department and um, you might set up your navigation options to um, show only the items that pertain to that group and then you could show the group or something like that. Um, so anything else any other questions anyone has or comments you'd like to make Does decompile work on ACCDE files? This is a question from Phil. Um, my usual process is to do the decompile and recompile at the very end before I make the executable as the last step. Um, so I don't believe you can use it or do that on an executable file itself. Um, but the, the general recommendation is to do that as late in your kind of, I would call it a rollout process as possible. Um, for example, I do things when I roll out code to some customers like add line numbers to my code and change the connection string from the development or the staging environment to the production environment. Um, that's pretty typical of a rollout process. But after you do all that editing, um, and before you're ready to compile into an executable to, and, and make that, that's when I do the decompile right at the end there. Anything else? Okay, if that's it, I will let you go a few minutes early. And again, if you joined us last time and, and uh, got uh, sent away, uh, let's uh, thank you for being patient and uh, waiting an entire month to see this. And uh, for those who missed it last time, uh, I will make sure to post uh, that the video is, is available when it is here in a, in a few days to a week. It does look like someone else is trying to type a message, so I'm going to wait just another second here. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, until next month, next month we are going to talk about uh, queries in Microsoft Access, and so hopefully we will be able to uh, learn about queries. That should be a little bit more of a geared towards beginner users, although we'll do some advanced queries in that uh, topic. So look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you everyone.